Because this story really is about two things, reconciliation and commissioning. Those two words, reconciliation and commission. So Jesus really does literally create the scene to bring Peter back. What's the story? They've seen Jesus die, at least those who were courageous enough to be there at the crucifixion. Many of them, remember, scattered, hid out because they thought, if they get Jesus, we're next because we're his followers. So they're literally hiding out, afraid for their lives. And so, remember, Mary Magdalene is the first one to see Jesus. Former prostitute, she has no standing whatsoever. They don't believe her when they say, it's the Lord. And so they have to go, Peter and John, you heard the story on Easter Sunday. They go and they see the tomb, and eventually Jesus starts appearing. But the thing is, is that it's, to use a big person's word, it's episodic. In other words, you can't predict when this is going to happen. So Jesus appears, and then he's, he's gone. And so here's Peter and his disciples. What are they going to do? Wait around for the next time that Jesus shows up? So they do whatever's in front of them. What are they going to do? Peter says, I'm going to go fishing. It's like that. In some ways, this is the first lesson. There are times in our lives as Christians where Jesus and his presence feels very, very close. And we want to be there. And then there are other times when we don't feel anything. It's not that he's not there. Remember, his promise is, lo, I am with you always, even to the very end of the ages. But there are times when we're more conscious of God's presence. And then there are times when we're actually more conscious of what feels like his absence, that he's just not around. Have you ever felt like that? Not your head, because I know you have. <laughs> and so what, is, what do you do in those situations? Well, you do the things that you're supposed to do. You fulfill your obligations. You do what's in front of you. Peter said, I guess I've got to go back to earning a living. Because that's what he was. He was a tradesman. He was a fisherman. So he and some of his other disciples, they get in the boat and they start working around the shore of the lake. Just like they had done probably for decades. And then, But Jesus, of course, is up to something. And that's the thing. Even if we have no sense of his presence, Jesus is always up to something. So he, unbeknownst to his disciples, are creating the scene. He appears, and he literally duplicates a miracle that had happened earlier in the calling of the disciples. It's a way to say, I still am who I said I am. So they're 100 yards offshore, and Jesus is on the, on the shoreline. He has a little fire going, and he calls out. It's, now, if you heard your rector read the gospel, it says, children, it, that's not meant to be in any way sort of dismissive. It would be as if you were out fishing in one of your little, you know, bass boats or something on a lake, and one of your neighbors saw you, and what, did, what might he say? He might go, if you're a bunch of guys, well, boys, did you catch anything? That's what he's asking. It's not a put down. So, and they reply, no, <laughs> we've been up all night. And what does he say to them? It's very interesting. See, it's exactly the same language that he said before. Throw your nets over onto the right side of the boat. Now, and you see, here's the thing. They, something inside of them probably recognized, even though they weren't conscious yet. I've heard that before. Because that's a landlocker term. He, Jesus is a carpenter. He's not a fisherman. He's not talking about what we would say, port or starboard. It's like the right side of the boat. And yet they do it. See, the first time they said, what does he know? He's not a fisherman. We've been up all night. We know how to work the lake. But this time they just instinctively do it. And of course, they throw the net over on the right side of the boat. And there's so many fish they can't even haul it into the boat. Bingo. Peter. It's the Lord. At this point, he is stripped down to the loincloth. And so you don't want to meet your Messiah when you're naked. I guess that's what Jesus means. He throws something on, dives into the water, and makes his way to shore before anybody else does. And see, Peter really loves Jesus, even in the midst of what he's gone through in terms of his betrayal. His heart and his passion are still there. So he's like the first one on the shore. Jesus has got a fire going, there's breakfast, there's fish. He says, get some more. So they all sit around and talk. I mean, Jesus has business to do with Peter. But he wants them to be comfortable in his presence. So, I mean, have this picture of a bunch of guys laughing and talking around a campfire while the girl and the fish they just caught. 
It's a very, very kind of comfortable scene. There's nothing sort of religious or, or solemn about this at all. He's just being with them as he had been for over three years. And then he gets to the point. Peter, do you love me? And of course the tenor of the conversation changes. Doesn't it? Because Jesus at that point is actually speaking not just to intellectually, he's speaking to his heart. Do you? He doesn't ask, do you obey me? Chris, the answer to that question is no. Do you have faith in me? Well, again, the answer to that question really might have been no. I, I don't know enough to trust you yet. I've seen you do miracles. You really are the Lord. But personally, no. He bailed, remember? And, and it's, that's a very, very cogent question. And it's an important one. Because it seems to me that that's what Jesus asks of us. I mean, if he asks if we will have faith, well, come on. There are times when we have faith. And then there are times where we don't know what we think at all. So if the call is merely to have faith, then the, our response has to be provisional. Well, hopefully most of the time, right? Or even the issue of obedience. Will you obey me? Oh, well, it's even harder. Because sometimes we want to be on the ready. And then there are other times where we, we you know, what's the Christian term? We sin. <coughs> we do things that God doesn't desire for us at all. And he knows it. So if the question is, will you obey then again, you have to sort of do this provisional response. Well, hopefully. What does it say in the prayer book? I will with God's help. Because we know that inside of us, that there really is this propensity to do whatever we want to do, rather than the thing that God asks of us. It's part of what it means to be human. See, Jesus knows all that. Remember? He's the one, what do we say, to whom all hearts are open, all desires know. We don't have to pretend that God does. So he asked the question that I think is actually the heart of the matter. And he used that word intentionally. Do you love me? Jesus asks. And of course Peter does. He's the one that dove over the side of the boat, anxious, wants to see this man. He loves him. Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. In other words, what has happened to you in no way disqualifies you for the work that I have for you to do. He asks him a second time, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Tend my sheep. In other words, take care of these people. I'm giving you something to do here. And then he asks him the third time, and the first thing, you get the fact that at this point, Peter feels exasperated and don't, don't you trust what I say, Lord? You know all things. You know what's in my heart. You know what's in my heart, don't you? See? And you know that I love you. I love you. Doesn't mean I will always do everything that you ask. Doesn't mean I'll always be strong and faithful and courageous. But you know, in my heart, you matter to me more than anything. You know that I love you. And that's what Jesus asks of Peter. And then literally predicts Peter's martyrdom. I think that's what Jesus asks of us. He knows our hearts. And what he wants and what he will put in us is not just occasional faith or occasional empowered obedience, although he does give us those from God the God. But he literally creates change inside our hearts. A flame, really. A flame of love. Now we you know, we're in a liturgical service and we're, we're very concerned about wanting to get it right and for it to look good. And, and I'm very conscious of that, especially when, you know, the bishop comes. You know, we want the songs to be sung well and we want the acolytes to stand up and 
to, for them to hold a candle so we don't want to be embarrassed. And, and poor, poor Tim, you know, this sound system is popping and he put his hand on my arm and he said, this doesn't normally happen to us. <laughs> it's okay. I, I, know the, I know the tension and the pressure. And I, I don't mean to cause that at all, except that's just a part of what happens when the bishop shows. But the fact of the matter is, is that what the Lord really asks of us is not performance, not at its root. He wants our hearts. Do you love me? Is the question. And you see, if our hearts are knit to His, whether we feel His presence or not, whether we fall down or get up, whether we believe or whether we're not sure what, our, what we believe, we're, we're His. We're in the palm of His hand. And that means, even in the midst of our imperfection, even in the midst of sometimes the things we wish we didn't do. He, in fact, can trust us to do things for him that he asks of us. See, that's the second part. There is reconciliation, but then there is commissioning. Because, you see, the love that he has placed inside of us, in fact, best gets expressed when we feed the lambs, when we take care of people in need where we do the things that Jesus gives us the opportunity to be able to do. I mean, look at, look at this community. What would happen? What would happen to St. Mary's here in Bellevue when, for example, say there was a fire in the community. The, the people lost everything. Who were the first people to show up to make sure that they were okay, that they had food, that somebody was working with them if they had insurance, or if they didn't have insurance, who would do what needed to be done to see if they couldn't get collections of clothing and furniture? Feed my lambs. See. Or in the midst of the people who are moving into this community, say the retirees, who would have the courage to say to the retirees who are here, okay, you've, you've now retired, you have time on your hands, what are you going to do for Jesus? There's a new opportunity in front of you. You're, you're empty nesters now. You don't have the obligations that you used to. There's a community in need. Let's figure out what we can do to serve them. Feed my lambs. How the love of Christ gets best expressed is in exactly that kind of service where the love not just flows in you, but literally flows through you care for the people that God sends your way. Not just reconciliation, but commissioning. There are things that Jesus asks of us as his disciples. Will we always do it perfectly? Will we take advantage of every opportunity? The answer is no. We won't, and he knows that. But he would rather us do the imperfect thing than to do nothing. Why? Because he loves us and we love him. He's won our hearts and that's literally the most important thing. As Brendan Manning, one of my favorite authors who recently died just a couple of days ago, said, Christianity at its heart is not a moral code. It's a love affair. That's, and it is out of that that we give, that we serve. That we're the ones who are on the ready to be available for God to use us, regardless of what that looks like in the opportunity. And the more we're changed by it, the more confidence we get, we look for opportunities to be able to connect, to talk, to be available to someone. I told the 8 o'clock service yesterday, uh, my son and daughter-in-law are here from England, and I've got a son dad from New York City. I'll introduce them at the offertory. And um, so what do they want to do? They want to go to the outlets, among other things. So that's what we did yesterday. So here we are wandering around the outlets down by International Drive. And we're in one of the stores. And, and I strike up a conversation with the guy behind the counter who's checking out. We bought something. And I said to him, I said, well, how long have you worked here? And he said, oh, two years. I said, do you like it? He said, no. <laughs> and literally within 30 seconds, he started talking about a degree he had. He started talking about someone's hope. And, and things began to change. I was a nobody. He didn't know who I was. But he was willing to open up. And I said, so 
I should be praying for God to give you the right job, right? And he's like, probably in his late 20s. And he said, yeah. Feed my lambs. So I want to say to you, we've got a group of people here who are going to be confirmed and received. At the end of the confirmation, one of the things that I will pray is that God will give them the work that they are to do. Confirmation in part should say, he's won my heart, and I'm saying yes. The reconciliation has happened. And now the commission. But they're doing that here. <coughs> What is the commissioning for St. Mary's? And what is it that they can be a part of with you so that you can stand shoulder to shoulder and join together to say, we're here to serve one another and out there. Because that's the way love is expressed. And if he has won our hearts, how can we do anything other than Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have won our hearts, that we are yours. And we thank you so much for it. We who could have literally wandered our whole life wondering if there was any meaning at all, whether the love even existed. Thank you that you have intervened. You created the scenes necessary, just like Peter, to reconcile us to yourself. And we thank you for it. And O oh Lord, as we gather for this confirmation service, would you pray that you would not only continue to restore and to reconcile, but you would also commission that you would make us available for you. And that you would open the doors and give us the eyes to see that we who know your love might be vessels of that love, that others might know it too. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen.